try to speak in a small group where discussion is encouraged and questions are asked. And this is kind of just uh, different, <laughs> you know. And uh, yes, we certainly are living in a very dangerous times and we were talking about impending World War III. We are talking about Israel being pushed to the corner with no allies and uh, the world turning against them. But there is a lot of other prophecies, right? That uh, let me read you one that is about to come true. It's coming true and it's about to come true even, even more. And I want to read you Psalm 68, 11. Now, when you read in the King James Version, this is how it reads. Great was the, uh, hold on, hold on. It says, the Lord gave the word and great was the company of those that published it. Now, um, this particular translation does not give justice uh, to, to these words because if you read it in Hebrew language, the meaning is better brought out in different translations. So let me uh, read it out of NIV, ESV, NAS, ISV, and all these translations that kind of translated this particular verse a little better. That's how it should read, okay, in, in the, uh, translated from Hebrew. The Lord announces the word, and the women who proclaim it are mighty throng, or they are mighty large army. Now, this is a prophetic, prophetic utterance, right? And this is fulfilling, and you can see it in the ministry of uh, Sister Leora here. Coming. This is what this verse is saying. We are coming. Yes. So there is a, a power that God gave to women. We are coming. And we are coming in a mighty throng and a large army. And we're there, not there yet, but we are coming because I believe that women are actually waking up to the fact who they are in the Lord, in their identity in the Lord. Now, uh, why is it so important? Because when, when you visit churches and when I came out of my cult, uh, most of you know that I was in a um, cult called Watchtower or Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, women are quite uh, suppressed in that cult, and they are suppressed in a lot of cults. And when I came out, I'm walking with the Lord, four years old, on very intimate relationship, one-on-one. -on -one, and I can tell you that there is nobody between me and my Lord, even though I love my husband dearly, honor, respect him, uh, I will die for him. He's my spiritual brother, my best friend, and my lover, but he is not between me. And Jesus, he's not, not there, okay? This is one-on-one -on -one relationship. So the purpose of this little tiny message I'm about to give you is to encourage sisters in Christ to come forward, to rise, and realize who they are in Christ, their identity in, in Jesus. They are strong. They are born again. And once they are born again and have Holy Spirit, they are well-equipped to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Now... We are finding out that in a lot of churches we are divided on women issues. Uh, a lot of fundamental church doctrines are saying that women are not to have ministries, uh, that they cannot speak publicly, they cannot teach, they cannot have authority in Jesus Christ, that they are under the men, that they have to obey their husbands, or if not husbands, then the elders in a church, and that their calling in life is different than the calling of men. And we are talking about spiritual life. They're saying that women are to fulfill their duties as mothers and wives and taking care of house and cook and clean and iron shirts and have babies and change diapers and, and so on and so on. And they are to find their identity in this and uh, be basically servant to their husbands and supporters of their husbands and make sure that their husbands have relationship with God and there is not hindered relationship between their husband who is a leader of a home. In fact, when I came out of uh, Jehovah's Witness uh, religion, uh, I went to a local church where I actually got rebaptized. It was in Fort My Myers, Florida. And uh, the local pastor said, which confused me, he said that uh, women, uh, that men are uh, priests 
of the household. There are priests in, in their houses. Well, when I met Jesus, I was very excited because it was a supernatural event and he came to my life quite unexpectedly. And I truly didn't believe that I can find Jesus through my husband. So uh, when, when they teach these doctrines that man is a priest of a home, I see it as an unbiblical doctrine because we are all priests unto God. And even women, when they are born again and find identity in Jesus Christ, they themselves are priests unto God. Okay, so um, recently I was kind of listening to a lot of sermons done by fundamental groups. And I don't want to name people here by, by names. This is really not what I want to do. But uh, a lot of these fundamental Baptist groups and pseudo-Christian groups like Jehovah's Witnesses or uh, followers of William Branham, you can, you can kind of Google them, who they are. Even Seven Day Adventist. Okay, so uh, I was listening to a lot of sermons uh, recently. I wanted to see how they view women and what is uh, uh, opinion on women. And in that one uh, pastor's church, who is a, uh, identified as a fundamental Baptist church, he f uh, forbids the women in his church to even say the word amen during church services. They are taking this scripture and, and words of Apostle Paul where, you know, uh, that women are not to speak, that their voice are, voices are shame. And if they want to ask anything, they ask their husbands at home. So he's applying that particular scripture that women are not to say anything and not even the word amen during services. But he's encouraging them to breastfeed. Right there in front of uh, all these men, he, he has special chairs for them. He says, go ahead and breastfeed here. It's okay. This is your calling for life. But you are not allowed to say amen. So because that would be your voicing out your opinion or agreement and you have no business to do so. So what is really sad is that we have our brothers in Christ that uh, we should have support from them. Love. We should find love and support. But we are kind of finding out a lot of times they're, they're becoming our enemies, right? They're trying to silence women. Now, we have to ask ourselves as women, we have to know how God is looking at us, not how men is looking at us, okay? What does God think of women? How does he view women? What is his word showing about women? And a lot of times, uh, the New Testament scriptures, sayings of Paul, uh, or some Old Testament scriptures are used in defense of patriarchy, right? And we forget that there is such a thing like abuse of scripture. And we forget that when we are studying Old or New Testament, uh, divine God, wrote divine scripture by Holy Spirit in divine languages. He didn't write scripture in, in English. He didn't write it in Russian, Polish, Slovak, but he chose specific language to portray what he wanted to say. The language was Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, right? And when we are studying Bible, especially the scriptures about women, it's good to really go to the source of original divine language, translate it correctly. And then how would people who lived in first century, how would they understood, how would they understand the message Paul was saying? How would they understand the words he was using? And how were they using this word? Because there is such a thing like evolution of of, of, of language. Our language constantly evolves and culture is different. Culture evolves, language evolves, and some things uh, like languages uh, that, that uh, some words that were used in um, uh, older times, they have a different meaning today. So the same thing happens to these Greek words. Okay, in a time of Paul, and I don't have really time to go into it very deeply. I would definitely need about two days of special woman conference. So we would go into, a, into every single scripture that they're using 
to defend patriarchy and silence of women in Christ. And we would go and really go into every detail and we would dig it out and talk about it and encourage this dialogue about it. And I don't have time. I have about seven minutes left. So what I have decided to do, 10, ten minutes. minutes, okay, or 10 minutes. You give example. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, we have to also understand when we study Paul, who was Paul? Paul knew Yeshua intimately, and we have to understand he would never go against anything that Yeshua taught. And I want to go to Luke chapter 10. Can you be please helping me? Luke chapter 10, verse uh, 42. Well, let's start at 41. And I'm going to read you a scripture here. Well, I'm going to start at 40, okay? It says, But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. So this is basically an answer to all these fundamental Christians who are saying that call of women in life is to care for the household and cook and serve and do laundry and, and iron clothes and have lots of babies and, and, and obey their husbands. No, our call is exactly what Mary did, is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and everything else is in a second place. Because this is what we choose. We choose the good part and we don't let anyone to take it away from us. Nobody will take it away from us. Okay, so uh, let me keep going. I want to bring to your attention three women, oh no, two women and, and, and one group of women in the Old Testament today where uh, let's look at how God deals with women, how he chooses women to do his work. Before you mention that, let me just say one thing those, for those listening. We do have on our YouTube channel, Stephen uh, Denoon, we have a section on women because she's not going in, and this is what's really sad, she's not going into the, the mistakes that are made in translations. And every single passage that is used against women is incorrectly translated, both in the Hebraic language as well as in the Greek language. And so definitely go and, and follow that up so you get the information. Okay, so let's go to a biblical examples. And first one, I want to bring out Deborah. Deborah is my favorite example. Okay, uh, let me go here. Who was Deborah? She was a judge of Israel. Her Hebrew name means bee, okay, or a spirited or woman on fire. And the word Deborah that, that was chosen for her because when she was attacked, she can sting like a bee, right? Okay. We can find that story in the book of Judges, chapter 5. So I encourage you to guys uh, read it at home. And she was married. She was a married woman to Lapidoth. But the Bible doesn't mention her husband as her leader other than she is married to Lapidoth, right? So in Hebrew, actually, she was a prophetess, which was the highest office to have. And she was a speaker of wisdom. She represented wisdom, someone with great capabilities to organize and command. She was an army commander, okay, a warrior. She led outnumbered and badly equipped Israelite troops to a great victory. There was a situation like David and a, Go David and a Goliath, Israelites in a disadvantage major disadvantage and she was chosen by Hashem himself by God of Israel to lead this nation into a battle she chose herself the most able military general man named Barak and she told him what he must do and Barak was a godly man and he was a smart man he knew that God of Israel is with Deborah and he listened. He even said, I'll not go to battle unless you go with me because I know that God is with you. Okay? Deborah relied on God and she had God of Israel on her side. 
she tricked the enemy army and drove them onto a land where they were bogged down. And then comes another woman. It was a Jael, or actually in Hebrew, you would say Yael, okay? And she used a tent peg and a mallet to kill enemy general Sisera. So she was a national hero to Israel. They were led by Deborah. Deborah led Israel for 40 years, brought the weak nation to a righteous standing with God. She came to power in Israel at the time. Israel had chosen false gods and they were in a very bad situation. Her leadership has certainly changed everything in Israel for the better. So she stands out in her courage, in her wisdom, in her reliance on God of Israel, an example of faith to all godly women, example of leadership and listening to God and completing the role God has bestowed upon her. And how many Debras we have today? I know, Sister Lira, you are a Debra. <laughs> you are a Debra. Now, let's go to another woman in the Bible that uh, these patriarchal circles don't like to talk about these women. They don't like to bring it out as it is from the Bible. They kind of belittle them even. Okay, and this is a um, example of uh, Abigail. How many of you know of Abigail? Okay, this is a story from the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 25. She was very beautiful. She was married to Nabal which that name is good for nothing man. And I really don't mean to sound like I'm talking against our Christian brothers because you, Sister Leora, and me, and, and we know that we truly love our, our brothers in Christ. And we, with this message, I'm not saying that we uh, Christian women are to look uh, upon our brothers any less. We are not above them, but we are not below them. This is definitely a call to Christian women to come to next to our husbands, next to men, uh, our Christian brothers and sisters, come next to them and fight a battle because this is definitely not a time to be silent. This is not a time to do sandwiches and this is time for a battle. We are at the end of time and we need each other and men cannot do it alone. Okay, so Let's go back to Abigail. What happened there? We see that uh, uh, the David sent men to and, and asked Nabal for provisions because he ran out of provisions, but Nabal refused. And he even insulted the King David. He asked, who is the David? Who is the son of Jesse, right? So David was angry. And what was he going to do? He took 400 men. And he said he's going to Nabal's household and he's going to kill all males, young and old, everyone. But as his wife heard about it, what did she do? Well, she prepared all the provisions and more than what David even asked. Went to meet David and she appeased him, right? She appeased him. So was she acting out of her own will? Was she acting out of her own relationship with God of Israel? Certainly. What was the result? The result was that she saved men in Nabal's house. <laughs> they were not killed. She saved them, right? And, and the Lord did kill Nabal after all later, and she became wife of King David, right? Okay, and then I want to go to a last example because we don't have time, but I must mention the daughters of Zelophehad. Can you please open up to Numbers chapter 27? This is very exciting, very exciting story. And I want Steve to take two more minutes and explain you the significance of this story from a Hebraic perspective and how it ties to redemption itself. But let me read it to you, okay? When you go to book of Numbers in chapter 27, it says, Then came the daughters of Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, the, of the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. And these are the names of his daughters. So these are the daughters. Uh, it's Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Tirzah. These were the, the daughters of Zelophehad. Zeloph uh, I can never say that right, sorry. It's uh, Zelophehad. 
And they stood before Moses and before Eleazar, the priest, and before the princes and all of the congregation by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. I'm going to stop here because where did they stand? They stood in front of Moses, Eleazar, and all the men of the congregation, brave women, in a patriarchal society where women had no rights, and they're coming in front of all these men, and they are demanding. What are they saying? Our father died in the wilderness, and he was not in the company of them that gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah, but died in his own sin and had no sons. Why should the name of our father be done away from among his family because he has no son? Give unto us, therefore, a possession among the brethren of our father. And Moses brought their cause before the Lord. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelophehad speak right. Thou shalt surely give them a possession of an inheritance among their father's brethren, and thou shalt cause the inheritance of their father to pass unto them. So we can see how the Lord decided for these women that they surely are worthy of inheritance. Now, this is much more deeper than just piece of land. We might think, oh, they just wanted a piece of land. No, this actually goes much, much deeper. And I want to give this word to Steve because he knows this from Hebraic perspective, maybe two more minutes. But it was really nice to uh, talk to you. And I want to tell you, my sisters in Christ, please rise, understand the power you have in the Lord, when you ask for spiritual gifts, when you receive those spiritual gifts, use them and don't let anyone come between you and the Lord. If the Lord is calling you to a ministry, take it up. Take up the ministry. Go for it because we must obey God rather than men. And here goes the daughters of Zion. So, well, let's, let's just take, we'll just quickly, I'll just quickly give you a little little rundown on it. When the daughters of Zelophehad, when they were actually getting the blessing, what this actually is saying, when they're wanting the inheritance, the inheritance is not land. It is the inheritance. It's like the eternal life, in other words. It is to maintain that name that goes down. So it goes beyond just a mere physical inheritance. It is to stay named in the tribes of Israel. It is, it is, it is, it is a, an example of being born again in one reality there is what it is. And that's exactly what Christ come to do. A true new birth, for those that may not know, a true new birth is to have the restoration what Christ did at the tree of life. When he breathed in the nostrils, and it says, he breathed into the nostrils of Adam a plural form of his own life. That's what came from the tree of life. When, when Eve was taken from Adam, she was filled with the Holy Spirit. Nowhere did he have to breathe into her nose. That's what these daughters are asking for, is that they have that Amen. same possession. Amen. They don't have to get it because of their daddy. They got it because they get it from God. Yes. And he's the yes. one that breathes Amen. the eternal life into you. And you don't get it from your husband. God does, It's just like when the Bible says, they misquote Paul and say, say that, uh, that she shall be saved in childbirth. No, women don't get saved because she has babies. What about the woman that's barren? Do you say then that Sarah couldn't, you know, no, come on, that's nonsense. The Bible says in the true Greek, she shall be safe, S-A-F-E, in childbearing because they were dealing with this, uh, this yes. doctrine of, uh, Diana. Uh, of Diana, the doctrine there, and they thought that they would die in childbirth if they didn't go and worship this goddess. So Paul was dealing with that issue, and he says, no, you will be safe in childbearing. So that's why all these, all these misconstrues, misconceptions, Amen. And sisters need to be free to recognize that you must have the Holy Spirit the same as your husband must have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit deals with you. He does not look at you in gender in this regards here. Okay? In fact, 
John the Baptist was a type of Eve. He types the true bride of Christ. He types Eve. And nowhere did God have to breathe in his nostrils the breath of life. He'd come from his mother's womb filled with the Holy Ghost, just as Eve came out of her husband's bosom filled with the Holy Ghost. God bless you. God bless you all. Rise, women of God. Amen.